So first, what, what is uh, rheology? So the rheology is a part of fluid mechanics, which is trying to uh, uh, understand the flow, the fluid response to a shear, to a, a stress, okay, like a shear. Um, and the, the, the most simple uh, response is the, si the, the response of a Newtonian fluid. Okay, if you take water and you shear water, you know that there is a a linear relation between the shear rate, the stress, and the velocity profile. Okay, this is constant viscosity. So the question is, when we we add particles in a shear, uh, what will be the effect of these particles on the response of the flow? Do we obtain an increase of the effective viscosity of the medium? Okay, so you assume that now your suspension is a kind of equivalent fluid, okay, you don't see the particles, you don't want to see the particles, you want to see that as an equivalent fluid, fluid plus particles, the suspension, so you want to know what is the suspension viscosity of that equivalent medium, and you want to know first if it is Newtonian, this is the first question, and if it is Newtonian, how the viscosity is going to evolve with the size of the particle, with the density of the particle, with the concentration of course of the particle, as many particles you get, uh, this is when you expect more uh, difference between single phase and two phase flows. Okay, so this is what is uh, rheology. Okay, so the question is what are the effects that we discussed before? So what is the effect of uh, hydrodynamic interactions? What is the effect of lubrication? What is the effect of collision? What is the effect of solid friction between the particles in the suspension on the uh, a global response of your suspension as an equivalent liquid, as an equivalent fluid. Okay, so you don't want to see the particle. You just say, okay, this suspension is like another fluid, and I would like to know what is his effective density, is effective, its effective viscosity. Okay, so this is a question of rheology. So first we have to discuss about the, the fluid forcing because of course the suspension will react to the flow depending on the on the flow forcing okay so the simple shear flow is a so shear flow is very simple but even that flow is a bit more complex uh, than two other uh, elementary flows so you may know or not uh, i don't know uh, that a simple shear flow can be can be separated into two contributions. Okay, so when you have a shear like this, okay, so you you do an experiment. So it's uh, very simple. So it's a you take a, a channel, and then you are going to drive. <coughs> you are going to drive that flow with a certain velocity. Here, you have no velocity. So you generate a linear flow, so it's called a couette. Uh, a couette flow. So this couette flow uh, is actually composed, so it seems to be very simple. Okay, the, the, so you, as you remember with the Taylor expansion, so we have no flow, this is the most simple, then constant flow, Constant flow, I'm not going to talk about the constant flow because when you have a constant flow like this and you place particles inside, they are going to be dragged by the flow, but they are not going to modify the flow because they are just transported by the flow. And of course, in, in that constant flow, there's no effect of viscosity. Whatever the viscosity of the flow, it will move straight. Okay, so no flow, of course, there's no effect of the particle. Um, constant flow, we see that we don't have any, we cannot have any information about the viscosity of the suspension because the particles are just moving with the flow without any disturbance. Okay. So if we do the Taylor expansion, the next one is linear flow. 
Okay, so linear flow seems to be very simple because it's a pure, uh, a pure shear. But even that flow is a bit more complex. It's a bit, it's a bit complex. Actually, you can, you can split, you can split a shear flow into two contributions. Okay, so I don't know if you are familiar with that, but a shear flow. Uh, so it's a bit of, uh, a bit of mathematics, but important to understand. So when you have a shear flow, so let's say this is x, y, so this is u, okay, so u is equal to gamma, gamma y, v is equal to 0, and w is equal to 0. Okay, so it's a simple 1D flow, which is just depending on the y direction. If you look at uh, the rate of deformation, so this is what I call E, EIG. So it's a tensor, it's a matrix, which is containing all the derivatives, du by dx, du by dy, du by dz, du uh, dv by dx, dv by dy, dv by dz, and dw by dx, dw by dy, dw by dz. Okay, so it's a matrix which is going to characterize completely your flow because you have the three components, u, v, w, and the three derivatives, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. Okay, so it will completely characterize your flow. If you compute this matrix, and, and generally, if you take a turbulent flow, all the nine components of that ma matrix will be non-zero. Okay, so you will non-zero everywhere, so it's a complex flow. In the case of uh, pure shear, it's very simple, because W is zero. Okay, so we know that we have zero everywhere here. Um, it is depending only on Y. So D by DX, D by DZ is always zero. So we have zero here and here. Okay? And V is equal to zero as well. So it is zero here. Okay, so you see that the matrix is very simple in that case because the flow is, is simple. So we only have du by dy. du by dy is gamma. Okay? In a turbulent flow, you have non zero everywhere. So for shear, for shear, you have only one term. One term, which is non-zero. And you may, uh, I don't know, did you do some matrix analysis in your studies? Yeah? So you know that any matrix can be, can be split into symmetric and anti-symmetric. Okay? Okay? Exactly. So you just have to take, if you want to take a matrix A and you want to take the symmetric part, it's a plus transpose of A divided by 2, and the anti-symmetric part is A minus transpose of A over 2. Okay, very good. This is the only math we need. Okay, so very simple. So this is what I did here. So I took this matrix, I took this matrix, and here you have the uh, um, anti-symmetric part. So you see gamma minus gamma. Okay, and here you have the symmetric part, gamma plus gamma and you have the one half in front. Okay, so I just took A, this matrix, or E, transpose of E, so gamma will be here, and I make one half of A plus transpose of A over 2, A minus transpose of A divided by 2. Okay, so I can show, I can show that a shear flow, a pure shear flow can be split into uh, two contributions. One is that one, and actually that flow, if you plot the streamlines corresponding to that matrix, it corresponds to a, a rotation. And this is the flow we used for the, the vortex. You remember? Uh, a, uh, gamma, gamma x minus gamma y. This is actually this. This is the rotation. And this one with positive values, symmetric matrix, it corresponds to a deformation, strain, stress. Okay? So now I'm going to place a particle inside a shear, which means I'm going to place a particle 
inside that row and that row because the sum of the two will give you the, uh, the answer. Okay, so this is this shear flow, if I place a particle inside, that will be the sum of rotation plus deformation okay so I will place the particle inside I have a question for the students good in, in math do you know why I plot this elongation along that axis because it could be, you know, like this or like that. So do you know why I chose to, to do the, the figure like this, with this direction of the, of the strain rate tensor? I don't know, I didn't. Sorry? Shear stress. What is it? Shear stress. No, no, it's not so. Why? Rectangular. Yeah, but why, why along that axis? Can I, can I draw it like this? Or, I don't know, we, you know, there, there's a certain, here there, there is a certain, there is a certain angle here, theta, okay? Why I choose to, to make the, the sketch like this and not like that or with a different angle. <coughs> exactly. So this is related when you do the when you do this transformation wh uh, when you do this transformation going from that matrix to the anti-symmetric and symmetric part and here if you are looking for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix you will find that the eigenvectors are actually along the this direction at 45 degree okay pi over 4 okay so these are the eigenvectors okay so this is exactly what you have to do and here the angle is pi over 4 okay so we come back to the effect of particles so now we have a particle which is placed placed in a rotation and actually the the full name of rotation is solid body rotation okay what does it mean solid body rotation means that the fluid is rotating like a solid. So if you place a particle inside a solid body rotation, the only thing that you can observe is the rotation of the particle. So the particle will rotate exactly as the fluid. So of course there will be no feedback effect of the particle inside uh, toward the fluid, so there will be no effect on the viscosity. So in the shear flow, the rotation has no effect. The particle has no effect because it is a solid body solid body rotation. So no no effect of particles. Okay? So now we come to that case. We place the particle into a region of elongation, a strain. Okay? If that particle possibly uh, deform, then you will observe that the particle will be like this. And then it will deform like this, and it will deform like this. Okay? Because you you strain, you try to elongate the particle, and if it was a droplet, for example, that could deform, then you will deform the droplet like this. Okay? But it is a solid body, it is a solid particle, so it cannot deform. If it cannot deform, of course, it will change the flow, because the flow would like to deform, but the particle doesn't want. So if the particle doesn't want to deform, it has to react on the flow. And this is going to generate a velocity perturbation in the flow 
And this velocity perturbation is going to dissipate some energy because you have new you know, flow modification. And this is going to generate dissipation, which means that you are going to change the viscosity of the fluid. Okay? So, no de so deform you have el uh, elongate, uh, deform um, how can I say that, uh, strain. but you don't have any solid deformation and that will generate flow perturbation okay so the deformation the strain would like to deform the particle, but the particle is solid, it cannot deform, so it will react on the flow, generating some flow perturbation, and this flow perturbation is going to dissipate energy, and then it will increase the effective viscosity. So this is the basic mechanism you have to understand for the rheology of suspension. Okay, everything is based on that. But of course, in a turbulent flow, it is much more complex, because here we, just, we are just talking about a, a simple shear. But actually, in turbulence, you have shear, you have vortex, you have strain, and the particle will react differently to all these kind of flows. But basically, what you have to keep in mind is when you place particles in the flow, the first and the most simple mechanism is that they are going to react to straining and generate flow perturbation, enhancement of viscosity. Okay, everything is, the rest of the lectures are, uh, is based on that. Okay? And this is the flow perturbation that you, you can find. So you see you have a strain rate, so you recognize the, the axis of compression and dilatation. And this is the flow perturbation. So you see the flow is react, the particle is reacting on the flow and generating a velocity perturbation which is opposed to the compression. Okay? It will react on the flow because the particle doesn't want to deform. It is solid. Okay? And, and, this is, and this flow, you have gradient into that flow and because you have gradient you have friction between the fluid elements and because you have friction you have dissipation of energy of fluid energy fluid, fluid kinetic energy so this flow is actually analytical so uh, a guy a very well known guy in, in fluid mechanics called bachelor with a t not the bachelor but, you know the series <laughs> the TV uh, series, so the Bachelor, uh, did, I think this paper is from the 70s or something like this, okay, R around that date. Uh, he did the calculation of the perturbation, analytically, okay, because at, at that time they didn't have any computer, so they, they were working with pens and paper sheets, okay. And, and he, fi he found this analytic solution, so you see here, and you see this equation here, this is the analytic solution of the flow perturbation induced by a particle in a pure shear. Okay. And then, based on that, because he knows analytically the flow, he is able to compute, again analytically, what is the uh, increase of dissipation. Okay. And what he obtained is an analytic prediction of the modification of the viscosity. Okay, this is called the Einstein estimate. Uh, so it has been done also by Einstein uh, with a different approach. Uh, and, and this is coming from this analytic solution. Okay, so you take a single particle in a shear flow without any, pa any, wa any walls, without any other particle, single particle isolated in a pure shear. You compute analytically the flow perturbation and from the flow perturbation, you compute the extra dissipation due to the presence of the particle compared to a pure fluid. And then you include this extra dissipation as an increase of the viscosity because the flow is the same. So to compensate the, the uh, increase of energy dissipation, you will increase the effective viscosity of the equivalent medium. Okay. And this is what is given in that, in that equation. So you say that the viscosity of the suspension is the viscosity of the fluid plus 
an effect which is related to the concentration. Because of course, if you have only one particle, you will dissipate some energy. If you have two particles, you will dissipate twice. If you have three particles, three more. And then if you have n particles, you will enhance the, the viscosity. Okay? So this is the, the Einstein estimate for the enhancement of the viscosity. What is the range of validity of that expression? The range of validity is, of course, for dispersed flow, because you remember that this analytic solution, which is the base of that equation, is for one single particle. So, of course, that will be valid, this equation, when the particles are very far apart from each other. Okay? So, it's very dilute. So, typically, this is a good approximate uh, when the concentration phi is uh, lower than let's say when then one percent okay so if I if I plot mu uh, mu of the suspension divided by mu of the fluid okay so I want to evaluate the enhancement of the viscosity so of course like when phi equal to zero, I start at one. Okay? When, when you, have, you don't have any particle, it's a single phase flow, so the mu is the viscosity of the fluid. So what tells you this equation is that it is linear. And the slope is 2.5. 2 okay? And it is, it is not 2.5, it's actually 5 uh, half. Okay? So it's not 2.5017, it's 2.5 and that's it. 5, 12, uh, 5, half. It has been derived analytically. It's a theoretical prediction. Okay? And it is valid up to 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? Less than, uh, or maybe a bit more, maybe 1%. Okay, let's say 1%. 0 0.01. Okay? So for very dilute suspension, you may see a small increase of the viscosity because it has been based on the solution for one single particle in the flow. So now you would like to, to have this uh, information for larger uh, concentration, okay? because in your process you will have, I don't know, 5%, 10%, 20%, 30% concentration. So you need more information. So now you need to account for the fact that the particles are closer. Okay, initially they were very far away, now they are come closer. What is happening when they are coming closer is that you have flow, flow interactions. Okay, so if you place a particle here, okay, close to that one, it will generate also this type of perturbation, but the two perturbations are going to interact. So you have to account for the fluid interactions between the two particles. Okay? That one is, you see that one is that one is generating a flow perturbation. Okay, it is uh, so like this, like this, like this, like this. If you if you place a particle here, this one also will do the same. So it will generate a flow perturbation like this, like this. Okay, but you see he, here, you will have interaction, of course. So y if there is interaction, the, the fluid flow will be different and the rate of dissipation will be different. So to get the next term into this uh, expansion, so actually this is a term in phi square, which is rising faster than phi, phi square is rising faster than phi, you need to account for interaction. And then Bachelor in uh, 72 did this calculation. Okay, in 72, he in, 70s, in the 70s, he found the solution for one particle. In 72, he found the solution for the interaction between two particles inside the flow under shear. And again, he found the analytic solution. Okay, these are very great papers. Uh, this guy is, did many, 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 many papers about fluid mechanics and particles. Okay, so he found the solution. And from the sol so this is the type of flow that you can obtain. So you see. If you have two particles like this or like that, 
you see that the flow perturbation now is depending on the orientation of the particles. Okay? Because if you have particles side by side like this or like this or like that, the flow is different, so the perturbation is different, so the rate of dissipation is different. And now it's becoming a bit more tricky because in a suspension, when you have more particles, you have many particles. So all the configuration are possible. So you may have particles like this, but because of the shear, they are going to move like that. So you have to make some statistics on your equivalent medium where the particles are moving everywhere. And it did that also. It did that work to look at the probability of particle positions depending on the, on the flow. Okay? And from that, you can compute the extra dissipation and the viscosity. And actually, he found that, you see, 1 plus uh, 5 half of phi, so this is Einstein estimate, plus a term in phi square. And this phi square has a, a prefactor which is between 6 and 7. It depends on the flow configuration. And this is now valid a bit more uh, with more concentration, so up to 10%. Okay? You can use that law up to 10%. It is quite valid. But now if you move to real applications, because in many applications you have 30%, 40%, maybe 50% concentrations of particles, so you need to know what is the evolution of the viscosity of the suspension when you increase the concentration above 10%. And then there is no more any uh, theoretical prediction. Okay? So initially the, the, these two formulas, these two equations are based on theory. All the rest is based on experiments and correlations. Okay, so, there's, so of course it will be uh, subject to uh, you know, experimental errors, uh, many things. Okay? So there's a, a, a paper uh, where they did a review of all the different uh, correlations, all the different physical mechanisms leading to uh, enhancement of viscosity. And what they found is all these plots, all these points. Okay? So here we increase the concentration, you see, from zero to very high concentration. And they, so you, 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 you see the Einstein estimate, you see the Bachelor estimate, okay, a bit more precise when you increase the concentration. And then at some point, when the particles, when the solution, when the concentration of the, of the suspension is increasing, you cannot only account for two particles interaction. You have to account for three particles interaction, four particles interaction, five particles, and there's no more analytic solutions. The equations are too complex. Okay? So the only thing you can do is either experiments or simulations, and then you extract from that data points, and from these data points, you may fit some curves, okay, some correlations, and then you fit the parameters. And these are the two very well-known uh, correlations that are used for suspension viscosity. One is due to Krieger and Dougherty, and the other one is due to Ehlers. And then you have fitting parameters that you can determine with your experimental data points. Okay? And then this is valid up to, uh, valid, uh, I mean, this is a good model up to uh, close packing when the particles are coming very almost to contact. And you see that the, what is interesting is to see that the viscosity is changing a lot. Okay? So when the concentration is low, about, uh, up to 10, 20%, you see that the enhancement factor is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so 7 times the viscosity of water. But when you have dense suspension, you may reach 100 times the viscosity of water, 1,000 times, 10,000 times. Okay, so it's becoming very, 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 very viscous. Not because the fluid is viscous, it's viscous because it's still water, but because you have many particles, and these particles are going to generate flow perturbation, flow uh, uh, fluid dissipation of energy, and also because you have contact. Okay, and this is what I'm going to comment. Okay, so this is clear for you. So this is a plot of the, the ratio between mu and the viscosity of the fluid, mu f, could be water or, or anything and it is rising due to the concentration of particles. We have estimates, theoretical estimates, up to that concentration, about 10%, 10 and then here, this is only correlation based on experiments, many experiments uh, which have been done over the, over the years. Okay, so when you increase the concentration, you have, you remember, the drainage between the particles, because the particles are coming closer, you have to drain the liquid, 
uh, and then that will dissipate energy. You have collision. Collision is also dissipating energy. You have friction between the particles. So as you come closer and closer to uh, close packing, when the particles are really in contact, all of them, then you will increase the suspension because you will increase the sources of possible extra dissipation of energy. Okay? So you have lubrication, film drainage, solid contact, non-elastic because you have restitution coefficient, and then friction, which is also dissipating a lot of energy. Okay, so this is um, so all all these things were related to suspension of mono-sized particles. See, okay, one single diameter. Of course, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending if you want to do research and engineering, uh, this is far more complex in the industry because the particles doesn't have the same size. You have the, the particle size distribution, and you have to account for this effect on the suspension. Okay, and what is the, the basic effect? When you have mono-sized particles, at some point, the particles are going to contact to each other. But you still have space inside. Okay? So you still have fluid inside. So there is a maximum concentration that you can reach with mono-sized suspension. And this is about 64% if the suspension is random. Okay? But if you have, let's say, a bi-dispersed suspension, which is the simplest polydispersed suspension, you have only two sizes then you can fit the small particles into the holes between which, are, which are in between the big particles. So actually you can reach a maximum packing fraction higher than the monodispersed case. Okay? So you can have 64% for one single size and for bidispersed, you see, you may fit many, part many small particles inside. And by fitting these particles inside, so you are, you are going to increase the maximum packing. So actually, you are going to decrease the effective viscosity of the suspension. Okay? Because actually, you are going to move back along that curve, and then you will decrease the suspension. So the basic effect of bidispersed suspension, and most likely of polydispersed suspension, is to have a reduction compared to mono-sized particles for the same concentration because you are big and small and the small are inside the big the, the, the big particles and they are going to help the motion of the big particles. Okay, so the basic effect is that. But this is very 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 simplified because in real suspension there are many phenomena which phenomena which are related to non hydrodynamic effect. Here I'm talking about fluid interaction, but you know that in very fine suspensions you have electrostatic repulsion, uh, Van der Waals attraction, you can generate aggregates, these aggregates can deform, can be stretched and, and, and break up, broken up, okay? So all these effects are not included in that lecture. All these non-hydrodynamic effects, which are very important in real industrial applications, cannot, are not involved in, into, that, uh, into these correlations. Because you have also to, evo to, to evaluate what is the pH, what is, what is the zeta potential, and, and many non-hydrodynamic things which are related to physico-chemical properties of your suspension. Okay. And it is far more complex. Okay. So, yeah. What is the assumption on the particle size? Here, the assumption is that they are all uh, micro particles, so no Brownian diffusion. Uh, so typically that could be in a liquid that could be particles above 10 micron, okay, from 10 micron to microscopic particles. And in that slide, they must be all of the same size, okay, so monodispersed suspension. This is the same here. If you want to account for polydispersed system, so there are some papers where they check the evolution with the PSD, but again, there's no real, uh, let's say, uh, general uh, answer. You have to, to look precisely at your PSD, you have to look at the particle interaction, if it is uh, repulsive, attractive, so it, it's very complex. It could be very complex. It could be very complex. One thing which is very complex when you do uh, rheology of suspension, of polydispersed suspension, 
is the, the homogeneity of your suspension, okay? Because when you have mono-sized particles, you can assume that they are, because they are only one single size, you cannot have very complex effect. When you have two sizes like this, you can have these three possibility. So you can have migration, okay? So when you do a flow, you don't forget that you want to mimic your suspension by an equivalent fluid, but it means that the concentration must be evenly uh, distributed. It, has, it must be constant because you see that all the correlation are function of phi. So if in your flow phi is varying, what will be the response of your flow? You will have different viscosities at different places. Okay? So if you have a real flow and you have migration, it means that the particles are not evenly distributed in your system, then characterizing, predicting the viscosity of your medium is very difficult. If you have by dispersed suspension, you may have also segregation because, again, you, what you would like to have, the simple configuration, is when the particles, the big and the small one, are completely mixed. But if because of the flow they demix, you have a region with small particles and a region with big particles, of course, viscosity of your system will be different than the completely mixed system. Okay? And then you can have also even more complex response. So, for example, the particles may align, the small particles may align with the big ones. And then it means that the suspension now will have a response which is different depending on the orientation. So, along that axis, that will be different than that axis. Which means that the viscosity, which is a scalar parameter, okay, it's just a number, in that case, it will depend on the orientation. So, it means that the viscosity is no more a scalar, it will be a, a matrix, okay? Because the response will be depending on the axis, okay? So you see that when you have a, a monodispersed suspension, it's already a bit complex, but when you have a bidispersed and polydispersed suspension, then the response might be very, very complex because you may have migration, segregation, and anisotropy all together in the same flow, okay? And then it is still very difficult to uh, to predict what will be the, the behavior and the response of the, of the suspension. Okay, so now I've been talking about hydrodynamic interactions. So now when the particles are coming closer, so this is actually a plot where you see the distance between the, the two surfaces as a function of the concentration. So when you have low concentration, the, the particles are very far away. So this is D over the radius. So they are very far away. The distance between the surface is very big. But as you increase the concentration, the particles are coming closer. So that distance D is decreasing. Okay? And at some point, it will be almost zero. And then you have contact. Okay? So when you increase the concentration, you have new effects. You have the effects of the contact between particles. And this effect is very drastic. So if you plot the evolution of the, um, the friction coefficient from pure fluid to contact, then you, you can vary over four decades. Okay, so the, let's say you have a, um, um, uh, yeah, I can, can maybe make a nice an experiment. You have a paper sheet, uh, just a uh, flat one, not with uh, asperities. Yeah, but I need one which is very, very, Yes, yeah. Okay. So you, you, you know what is lubrication. So if I take this uh, paper sheet, so you see it is almost sliding on the, on the, um, and then suddenly it will stop. Okay? So I do it again. So you see it is sliding and then it stops. So why? It's because if you look closely be between the, this uh, paper sheet and the table, when the the sheet is sliding, it's because you have a film of air in between, which is going to lubricate the motion. And because the air has a very low viscosity, the rate of friction is very low, and then the paper is sliding. But at some point, the paper, because of the weight, it will come closer and closer to the table. At some point, it will touch the wall. And then you come, you move from solid, uh, fluid friction to solid friction. And the coefficient of friction is different, different by 
two, three orders of magnitude. And then it will stop very quickly because the friction is very strong. Okay? So this is what is plot on that, uh, on that figure. So this is the increase of the friction coefficient when you have lubrication between a moving wall, be between two moving walls, and you move from hydrodynamic lubrication to what is called elasto-hydrodynamic, mixed, and finally, you have solid friction. Okay? And of course, you reach solid friction when the gap distance is of the order of the roughness. And then you, you don't have any space to fill that with liquid, and then you have contact with, between the two solids. And this contact between two solids has a rate of dissipation which is way higher than the free dissipation. And this is what is happening when you increase the concentration. When you increase the concentration, the mean distance between the particles is decreasing. And at some point, it is of the order of the roughness. And then you have contact between the particles. And this is why you observe here this drastic increase of the viscosity. You see from, a frac from 10 to 10,000 when the concentration is increasing. Okay, so it's because you have more and more probability to get solid friction between the particles. Okay, so this, this has been done in, in some papers. So they looked at the effect of the roughness on the suspension viscosity, and when you reach high concentration, you see that you have this increase of the viscosity because you have contact, many contacts, many solid contacts between the particles. Okay, so you see that you have four effects. The first effect at dilute for dilute suspension is <coughs> the effect of the shear flow with the particle which doesn't want to deform because it is solid, so it is reacting on the flow and generating extra dissipation. This is valid up to 1% concentration. Then you have two body interactions, and then it is valid up to 10%. This is the work of Bachelor and Einstein plus Bachelor up to 10%. Then when you increase the concentration, you need to drain the film between the particles, so you have lubrication, and this is usually what happens between 30% and, uh, and these uh, 50%. And then at some point, you have collisions when the concentration is very high, and above collision, you have enduring contact, so contact, solid contact, which is lasting long time, and then you have solid friction, and then you are in that part of the curve between 100 and 1,000 times the viscosity of the fluid. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. The, I will give you the slides. At the end, you have some comments about non-Newtonian response because it could be even more complex. For now, we just discussed about the viscosity of the fluid, but actually, you can have suspension which are going to behave not like a Newtonian fluid, but like a non-Newtonian fluid, and then it's a bit more complex. Uh, so you will see some slides at the end on that, on that topic.